Hello everyone. In the last three weeks, we have been reading and reflecting on the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Let me briefly recap what we have learned so far. Paul establishes the Ephesian church, appoints Timothy as pastor and elder of the community, and continues his missionary journey to other places. While he is in Macedonia, he hears of some problems in the Ephesian church. As a senior pastor, he writes to N. Timothy to encourage him in his ministry, remind him of his responsibility, and advise him to deal with the problems. So, he first instructs Timothy about false teaching, worship, leadership, and the use of material goods. At the end of his letter, he makes a strong and personal appeal to Timothy on his own spiritual development and discipline. We read a part of his personal instructions to Timothy in today's text. These instructions may seem harsh and demanding, but they also reveal Paul's love and concern for Timothy and others. Friends, Paul addresses Timothy as man of God. Man of God is one of the Old Testament titles given to the most powerful and faithful prophets and servants of God, like Moses, Samuel, Elijah, David and others. Who is a man of God? According to the scriptures, a man of God is someone who completely trusts in God, someone who believes in the power of God, and someone who belongs to God. For Timothy, the title Man of God must have been a great honor and encouragement. Paul instructs Timothy that he must pursue virtues and noble qualities, for he is man of God. However, we must take note of the text starting with, But you, man of God. What was Paul's concern so that he says, But you, man of God. In the verses before the above text, Paul points out those teachers whose words contradict the teaching of Jesus Christ and whose actions go against godliness, whose deeds do not match their words, and who are full of malice, greed, envy, slander, dissension, and hatred towards one another. So, Paul warns Timothy of the evils prevalent among the teachers and leaders of the community and encourages him to pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. These virtues are not put haphazardly, but in order of importance. William Barclay, a great theologian, explains these virtues in the following way. Righteousness refers to right living. It means one does what is right or due to both God and man. It is said to be the most comprehensive of virtues. This virtue points toward God and man. Devotion refers to reverence or respect toward, towards God in one's life. Faith is simply trusting in God for everything. Love is the virtue of the man who remembers always what God has done for him and others. Ultimately, such love also motivates the man to love his neighbor. These three virtues 
devotion, faith and love point toward God. Patience is endurance or perseverance. In spite of adversity and suffering, one simply bears all things. The person who has the virtue of patience does not just accept the experiences but conquers them. This virtue points toward one's own life. Gentleness is the virtue which points toward others. The person with gentleness serves, loves and forgives others in great humility. So, Paul encourages Timothy to pursue these virtues. Moreover, Paul tells him to compete well for the faith. In other words, Timothy is reminded that the pursuit of these virtues is hard and a struggle. In order for Timothy to succeed, Paul suggests four things. 1. Timothy must remember his profession of faith in the presence of many witnesses. He must constantly remind himself of his pledge to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. 2. Timothy must remember that his profession or confession of faith is the same as Jesus before Pontius Pilate. What is the testimony of Jesus before Pontius Pilate? When Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of Jews? Jesus answers, You have said so. So Timothy is reminded that confession of his faith involves not only accepting Jesus as his Lord, but also suffering like him. Three, Timothy must remember the coming of Jesus. He is reminded that his whole life is a preparation for the coming of Christ. Four, Timothy must remember God. Timothy must remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is the blessed and the only ruler who will make manifest at the proper time the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable life, whom no human being has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal power. Amen. In other words, Timothy must remember the Lord Jesus Christ is God and everything belongs to him. Friends, these instructions are not just to Timothy and the early Christians, but also to all of us. Through our baptism, we have become children of God, man and woman of God. On the day of our baptism, we have been claimed for Christ. So, we do not belong to the world anymore, but to God. Because we belong to God, we are called upon to avoid the things of the world and to pursue the things of God. It is not by fleeing or avoiding evil alone we can find peace and joy in life, but also by pursuing virtues, righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Today's gospel story is a perfect example of the most important of all virtues, righteousness. We must do what is due to both God and man. We read the parable of the rich man in hell and poor Lazarus with Abraham in heaven. Abraham, who is a tremendous example of faith and righteousness reminds the rich man that he has failed to be righteous during his life on earth. 
we must also truly express our reverence, faith and love for God. We must be willing to endure all suffering and patiently wait for the coming of the Lord. We must be gentle toward our fellow human beings. However, pursuing these virtues will never be easy. We may belong to God, but we still live in the world. And so, we will experience a constant struggle between the things of the world and the things of God. As we struggle in pursuit of these virtues, let us remember and meditate upon what Paul recommends. Let us remember first and foremost that we have pledged ourselves to Jesus Christ through our confession of faith. We profess often, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and the earth. In other words, at the time of baptism and each time through the profession of faith, we declare Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Second, let us remember that our confession of faith in Jesus as our Lord includes our pledge to do what our Lord has done, pledge to undergo suffering as He has undergone. In the profession of faith, we not only proclaim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but also make a pledge before many witnesses that we accept and believe in the Lord who was betrayed, crucified, died and rose again. Third, let us be reminded of the coming of Christ at the time of our death and that our whole life is a preparation for seeing God face to face. Finally, as a Christian leader or parent, let us pray, let us pay careful attention to our personal piety and religious practices before we teach and encourage others to pursue these virtues. Let us first pursue the virtue of righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience and gentleness. Let us offer our love, forgiveness, kindness and compassion to someone, not because the person is our spouse or friend or brother or sister or master or servant, but because we are men and women of God. We are people of God. Amen. God bless you.